sailors come from. Uh, yeah, this is, this is one of the things, but uh, uh, Colonel Redmond uh, showed you the slide. It's very impressive. It's a huge, huge area. It's, it's very large. It's extremely long. And you can, unfortunately, you cannot monitor everything. But, but we do plan about that and execute. I mean, you, you raise a great question in terms of it, it would appear to be easier to do something like that. But of course, operating in, the, in those waters, apart from the pirates, are also legitimate fishermen. And how do you tell the difference between one and the other? Legitimate fishermen there carry personal weapons because that's the culture. Um, and so, you know, at, at what we'll stay, I mean, we're trying to operate in a legal framework that says, actually, you can't just stop everybody leap on board and say, who are you and what are you doing? Because actually the, the, the question of legality of what you do and don't do, which just, I only add that it, because it further complicates the problem. But yes, you know, uh, uh, as it says, you know, trying to track practices, methods, obvious routes is a way of doing it. But we're only still addressing you know, a symptom, which is piracy or kidnapping ransom is a profitable business. Uh, and as you've heard, you know, lots of people want to become pirates, not because it's a romantically attractive thing, but economically it's a really good money spinner. Um, and it's having to address that aspect of saying it isn't a good idea. Uh, you know, now, it isn't a good idea if we manage to, you know, to, to sort of you know, deter, if we disrupt and prosecute and incarcerate all these attackers, but as you know already, you know, the issues there are much wider on that one. So it, it, you know, it has to be a multifaceted approach. So it all leads back to length. It all leads back to where it's got coming from, where the fuel from, where it's got weapons from. What's, dri the ladders, no 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 What's driving their need to become pirates? Okay. That's the question really, isn't it? Why do they want to become pirates? Or kidnappers? Colonel Swenson, I thought you also had a point like that. No, I just want to lag that I think the UNAFRA has tried to, to uh, adapt to the, the tactics used by the pirates. But, but again, even if they have mother ships, I just saw some new pictures of uh, one whaler, as they call them, fully loaded with, with diesel and two small boats. And they were a, a group of pirates operating independently. And they, again, they, they don't need a harbor to. to for the base to just pull up boats on the shore and for to, to sort of survey them and kind of keep track of all these these small groups on this new shoreline is just very great. But, or it's a very difficult task. So um, if you can address the issue on land it would be another thing, but then we're talking about all other operation I would say. Good something else. I'll, 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 let me just add one one aspect to this. Um, just, just for information, the African Union has repeatedly asked um, for an international naval blockade of uh, Somalia um, that would uh, prohibit all trade that is not there to ports held by the Somali uh, transitional government. Um, and also, they also asked for an area blockade. Um, but so far in the United Nations, there's no consensus um, for uh, imposing such a blockade um, in the United uh, in the Security Council. So that's just a piece of information. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me thank you all for making this possible today. From a UR, NGO activist, uh, it's quite a, quite a reason of pride to see the, such a glorious navy from European history that in the past not been seen in such a symphony, now to see them cooperating together. So it's really something that makes us very proud. I'd like to say two things. Number one, um, this is an operation that is the first time that the EU works together on, on its common command. And we've been talking about this for many years. You were not here, but we've been here for a long time as an NGO. About seven or eight years ago, there was um, a similar meeting with all the European Union at the chair. With the chair. And uh, one point it was made by the, uh, the colleague of uh, Colonel Le Salier, uh, Colonel Patrice Sartre, which now is the general of Bank of France. Uh, and he said something very nice. He said, what happened to our common schools, our common academies? What, what are we doing at the academy? How are we working at forming a sense of belongingness somehow in the European Union coordination? How the France and UK recently 
like, like common up many things that would have been unthinkable even 20 or 15 years ago, but now they're working together for different issues, even regarding the common air, air aircraft, some car carriers and so on, many things are very nice to see, but it's still bilateral. Are we really, is it working, this common coordination at the EU level? Do you yourself, as, as, as people in the field, have you seen this works out? And how are we going moving forward to be, uh, let's say, to, to, to make a sense of uh, belonging to the EU reality of on the European security defense policy? Anybody want to, to take this on? I think if we cannot say no. <laughs> of course it does. Uh, uh, there is, uh, now we have five operational HQ. Uh, operational HQ Northwood is, is the one taking the lead in, in Atalanta. But there's some others. Uh, for instance, during the um, U4, Chad, and RCA operation, it was the French uh, operational HQ, there's another one in Italy, there's another one in Poland, so, and, and, and we have procedures already in place within the framework of the European Union with its own uh, procedures, but also in, in the framework of NATO. We cannot forget that um, many of the NATO countries also belong to, uh, to the European Union. So, yes, it does. Yes, we do coordinate. And, uh, we, we haven't mentioned anything about shape, right? Shared awareness and the confliction. Uh, uh, it's an it's a, um, initiative for uh, forum where the different the different uh, task forces in, in the area um, meet or virtually meet to exchange information. Uh, you you for sure you, you should have uh, come to the conclusion that the, the intelligence sharing is one of the key aspects of uh, of this military operation. Uh, we have, um, besides Atalanta of the European Union, we have uh, an AO um, force called uh, Ocean Seal Shield Operation. We have a uh, US led uh, task force. Uh, and we have um, individual countries' in participation over there, and, and they share all the intelligence and they share. Um, Information that they can they can uh, put in common in this shared awareness and the confliction system. Um, I don't know. What else? I think <coughs> Sweden has actually participated in all EU-led operations since, since the launch of it, and, and this is the best example of a, a well-led EU operation from a foreign perspective, you know, all the way from the. From Brussels to the operational headquarters and down to the ports. So, so we, we have no, it's a very good example that we are actually improving. Uh, so we have a question here. Yes. Other questions, please. Thank you very much for um, these very interesting presentations and uh, clarifications. Um, I had a question regarding um, the pattern of uh, operation of pirates, um, how do they select their targets? Do they have any intelligence? Do they have radars, for example? How do they choose their prey? Uh, which ship to attack and which is uh, perhaps not, not worth to attack? Do they have any information in an organization on the preparations? And the second question is uh, the money they collect for ransom. Um, these are huge sums of money, I would uh, presume, and uh, it's much more than the, the simple uh, pirate uh, or uh, people living in, in um, the fishermen uh, they need. What happens to the money? Um, has anybody, um, uh, I, I suppose, uh, within the comprehensive approach, this has been made, but um, has anybody tried to go after the money? What happens with these huge millions of, of dollars, uh, where do they go? Um, and that, that would be an interesting question. Do you have any information on that? Thank you. Like, like air corridors. 
most of the uh, of the ships follow the same path. So we, that, that's one. So you only have to be waiting over there like a wolf until you, you can find uh, uh, a, a, a lonely ship. But and that's the case for particular uh, Spanish fishing vessels over there. Um, there, there is a um, um, fishery of a tuna fishery area uh, north of Seychelles, and, and actually they kidnap two, uh, as far as I know, probably more, uh, more three um, tuna fishing boats uh, vessels. Uh, so, so the, you, and, 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 the, and the fisheries are very well located. So you only have to go there, launch the, the boats, and kidnap them. The ship. Have you gotten the money? That I don't know. It's. Sorry. I have a, I've actually many questions. Uh, I mean, one, the first one is uh, what is my country here? Italy. There's no any guy that represents uh, Italy. I know it was uh, a general Lazo supposed to. Yeah, he was coming here to cancel the last point for another application. And then uh, we don't have any point of view of Somali people, any representation that will be actually very important. My first question is why all the politics have failure? So what do you think we should do politically to make, because if I was a Somali guy, a Somali uh, guy, I would be a part I mean, I have to support my family. Mm, I, uh, if you know very well about Somalia, you cannot really be uh, uh, an agriculture because there is different sides. I, I think what he's trying to say is, what are we doing to create a functional government? Politically. We've been trying for decades now, it's always failed. Is there anything being done to create a government that functions with its own police and its own security services? It's the best way for it. So just before we come back to that question, which is a key question, so because I, I thought it was a follow-on from from your question, just to answer the last piece of your question is, yes. uh, with regard to intelligence, it, it depends. It, there are large groups of pirates. Some actually are slightly better organised than others. Uh, the ones who are not organised are the ones that uh, typified by the ones that tried to board the U.S. warship. Not a clever idea if you're a pirate. <laughs> um, but others, yes. Others do, and it's more targeted by, uh, a lot of it's now being driven by who pays ransoms. Is it a trap? That's a good key intelligence function. So there's an issue there that has to be addressed at some stage. Um, and your, your second point, with, um, you know, sort of with regard to, to that sort of the, the money, is yes, work is taking place um, to try and to inter intercept and interdict that. But what we are seeing is that you know, some of these pirate groups are being funded by, in inverted commas, businessmen who are paying the stake. But the stakeholder is getting the ransom money back. And the stakeholder is the same person that knows how to launder that money quite successfully. So it's trying to find out who the stakeholders are behind the pirates, which is another key facet. And it leads us into the land problem. Um, you know, uh, regrettably, I'm, you know, I'm a soldier. You know, the political solution is the political solution. I know that. But within Somalia, yeah. I mean, what we can say is that both, you know, the transitional uh, national, uh, the, transit, the, the TFG, the federal government, put land in Somali land, so the three states are working together. They recognise the issue of piracy, and they recognise that it, it is a key issue in their ability to establish a, a government which is both supported by the population and which can exercise influence and control. Because they recognize it is doing the, you know, the domestic economy no good at all to actually be fueled by, by crime. So yeah, they are working at it, but you know, when you say it takes a long time to establish a, a government, it does take a long time to establish a government. You know, uh, and in a, in, a, in a situation where we see in Somalia, it's probably not going to take, it's not going to happen in any short term either. John? I think you said it well, and you have to re remember that 
the Somali government broke down in 1991. And the TFG, the current transitional federal government, came into power in late 2008. So that uh, was what, uh, almost 18 years. And uh, a rule of thumb is that it takes roughly as long to undo the damage of, uh, of breakdown of authority as it has done to for, for, for the breakdown actually to occur. So we're looking at an 18 year period, roughly one generation you can say, um, for a functioning state to emerge in Somalia. Um, although there are some, some quite encouraging signs there and, uh, and outlined in my introduction uh, that the European Union at least is doing uh, what best it can to support the reconstruction of, of governance and, and security in, in Somalia. Uh, EU member states are, are doing their share bilaterally as well. Uh, so there is what's going on. If I may just add one word on, on the money laundering aspect as well. Um, this is extremely difficult, <coughs> made extremely difficult also by the fact that um, Somalia is a, a very, a very, very Muslim country. And um, the, the financial system in Muslim countries, in traditional Muslim countries, works different from our financial system. Um, in essence, it, Somalia works on, on a system called Havala, um, which is a, a confidence-based system. A confidence-based system, passwords being passed on between couriers and so on, means, of course, that there's no, no credible accounting, at least not according to our standards. And if you don't have accounting, it's very, very difficult to, to follow the money trail. So this is uh, just another added layer of, of difficulty of, of following uh, that money trail. Yes, please. Uh, another uh, thing I want to ask you, you just mentioned that Spanish ships go to fish tuna there, and not only Spanish, Spanish uh, fish uh, boats go there to fish, uh, feel like Italy, whatever. Hello, hello. So uh, I was saying, if all the big corporation of fishing, the fishing go, uh, big corporation go in the area to fish tuna, they will take away all the good fish. And what's remaining to the other fishermen? What's it, what's what's the? Okay, you say to a Somali guy, go and fish, but no fish because we already took all of them. And when I say we, I say our world, the, the Europe, United States, whatever, who cares do the big fishing corporation things. And what's the alternative you give to these people? And by the way, if you go to fish tuna, you already know that tuna is a end of the line. We can't fish tuna anymore. I know you are a soldier. But I just want to tell you that you do a good job. I, I mean, but when you go after this guy, you don't go after a pirate. You go after a person that doesn't have much alternative. So that's it. Are there other questions? Otherwise, I, I, I will take the liberty of replying. Just to make two, two remarks, I think you're right um, that there is a link between fishing and the, the emergence of piracy. Um, and I have, no, I have no, no, no way of checking if it's true, but it's a credible story that I've been told actually by, by the Somalis. Um, in, the, in the course of the breakdown of the state authority, um, fishing licenses were issued to European and other uh, fishing companies um, to fish off the coast of Somalia uh, by various uh, authorities claiming that they were authorized to issue these, these kinds of licenses. Um, so you have competing authorities. And the companies uh, went out to fish thinking that they were doing something completely legal because it was, yeah, they had a license after all, they paid for it. Um, and um, then competing authorities or fishermen from, from neighboring regions or villages got upset and, and started attacking those, those foreign fisher birds. And that's, that's in essence how, how this whole business of piracy um, uh, begin, began initially in the 1990s. And it has since, I think, uh, become removed from 
the fisheries aspect. And if you talk to the World Health, uh, the, the World Food, Food Program, um, it's quite interesting that uh, they insist on the fact that fishing has never been a mainstay of Somali uh, livelihood of, of Somali society. Somalia is a society that's, that's very much traditionally based on, on um, cattle herding, cattle breeding. That's the largest exporter of, of camels uh, to the Arab Peninsula, still to this day, by the way. Um, and um, fishing was, was basically a way of, 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 of life for very small coastal communities only. Um, so the, the fishing problem today, I don't think, can be accounted for as the reason why Somalis go uh, turn to young Somalis turn to piracy. I'd also just like want to add one more point. Um, Somalia has about well, there are about eight million Somalis out of whom there's about four million still living in the country. So we have about four million Somalis in, in Somalia proper. Of those, roughly three million nine hundred uh, and uh, ninety-five thousand do not engage in piracy. Um, so just statistically, the fact that you are a Somalia living in Somalia does not make you a pirate. Um, so that's got to be another reason why people turn to pirates, uh, piracy and why they do become pirates. These are not warm and fluffy people in the um, Other questions? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> but as you know, Italy is kind of, uh, I don't know if, as you know, Italy is a very important temperature, probably. Uh, do you think they can do something politically to help to restore the groups that uh, they, the actor, the involved of the land in, in Somalia, or just an option that, I know that Italy in this moment is not the best political nation, whatever, but do you think they can do something? I mean, if they want to. I do not want to, to, to monopolize this discussion here. Um, I think Italy is, is one of the leading actors in, in Somalia. Um, and I, I, I really think that, that of the two European countries that have, that have the greatest influence in Somalia, I would say it's Italy and it's, it's, it's the United Kingdom. Um, and the others, I think, can also play a very important role and are playing a very important role. And I also think that the European Union is playing a very important role um, as a whole, um, which is why the European Union is engaged in the contact group on Somalia and why it's been a founding member of the contact, of the contact group on piracy uh, off the coast of Somalia. So the European Union and, and its member states all together I think, are doing their very best in tune with other international partners to help. Uh, but uh, as I said before, um, this is we're in for the long run. This is, a, this is a slow process. But I would like to, to, to turn the questions on the table a little bit back to our Operation Atalanta and the, the operational questions at hand. Are there questions concerning the military operation the Operation Atalanta? Yes. It's a quasi military and uh, the after capture. The, the, what happens after you cast them? After you have them? And they are still suspects. So they're not indicted. I had the pleasure of meeting Captain Phillips. If you remember him, he was the American uh, captain of the ship that was captured, and the Navy SEALs um, operated and captured the four, actually they, they killed the four and captured one, the captain of the crew of the pirates. What happened to him? He came to the United States, and he was tried. I understand that you mentioned that there was uh, uh, other pirates that they were sent to Brussels or, I'm sorry, Dutch uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. So what happens, they, do you catch them and they go to different countries? There's no central system that tries them under one law, so they're happy they <coughs> don't go to Russia and they go somewhere else? I just happened to see a video today of, uh, that may be in that work. How, how does the system work? You, you, you all out in the, in the ocean, you capture them, you bring them to a central location and they go on. Not all the, 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 pro, the, the problem. I, I know. I knew that. Uh, I know that uh, from the, the 
the, the, the military operations uh, that uh, involve France uh, to take, retake the, the, the yachts uh, in 2008, we bring them in, in France. But uh, I think that seems that but, uh, uh, the um, process is quite long, and, uh, and uh, in, in this case, it was uh, we, we caught them in, in, uh, in action during the time. Uh, the main issue is, uh, to, uh, as uh, we say, conspiracy is not, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, an issue to prosecute some, uh, some guys uh, sailing in the, in the ocean there. Uh, so uh, uh, we try also to make some uh, arrangement with Kenya, uh, but uh, I think it ends at the uh, end of September uh, because, uh, uh, as uh, it was told, uh, there is no place there and uh, for, for legal matters uh, the, the prosecution can be uh, the process can be uh, continued but there is some example like this but uh, it's the main, uh, main issue and uh, each country uh, has its own uh, process to bring it back in this country or try to find a neighbor, uh, neighbor country but uh, it's, a, it's a main issue just to, to more specific answer to your question, the EU has an agreement with, with Kenya and the Seychelles to, to prosecute pirates. Um, but, but still, we, what, what, when a naval ship uh, finds pirates uh, that they believe are pirates, they, pirates, they, they have to, to, since this is criminal activities, they have to gather proof. They have to send the proofs to a prosecutor that decides whether the proof is enough to go to court. Uh, and these are sailors, it's not police that we have out there. Uh, so, so sometimes they fail, even though they are convinced, they can even see that they have done pirate activities, they cannot collect the proofs that they hold in court. So then they have to release, which creates all these problems. From a Swedish perspective, we have the problem that we cannot prosecute them in our own country it, it, because of our national uh, regulations. It's, it's, it's a practical problem. Because if we arrest someone, first of all, we have the issue of it, it's not the police that actually arrest these people. Um, because by Swedish law, it is actually police activity that we are carrying out on the Indian Ocean. Uh, we need to, to send the, 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 the arrested to the prosecutor within 48 hours and present the proof for him, which is practical. It's impossible to do that. So we need to find other solutions. But I know that all the members, the member states that are involved have their own uh, national regulations on this. But the main thing is that we have agreements with states in the region. Uh, and there are a lot of difficulties with that as well, of course. And there is a national debate on all this. It's a, there is a moral aspect of this. We, we send, we send the pirates to prisons that we, we, we don't accept from a Swedish standard. I don't want to go into that. And then you, maybe we have to wait for the, the report of uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Long, uh, which has been asked uh, uh, by the, the Secretary General to find uh, the way to, to deal with this uh, issue. It sounds like you're fighting a good battle, but it's, it's difficult to win. You have a good point. Um, it's it's a battle. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, the solution is not just trying to reform a legal institution. I mean, the, the solution is to build regional capability and capacity to remove the problems that have just been outlined. So, actually, regionally, the states that have been doing really much are most affected in the area, and from which the majority of pirates come can apply their national law against them. So that really is where we should be going at. What this is, is at the moment is just, again, it's another facet of a much bigger problem. If I may. Um, I would like to encourage you to uh, go to the Atalanta webpage within the European Union, and you will have um, real updated information about this. Uh, but I have some uh, official data regarding what you were asking. Uh, between December 08 and September 10, sorry, September 10, um, 
There were 258 total attacks, uh, successful 74, frustrated 184. Piracy suspects uh, released 88, 75 to Kenya, 11 to Seychelles, and 2 to Spain. Um, total of kidnapped uh, vessels uh, in the 20 September probably is that this information is not updated. It's 16 with 351 um, prisoners. And total uh, destroyed boats, 37 pilot, pilot boats, and uh, uh, repelled boats for the form. I uh, can tell you that uh, two year actually. No, no, no. From, yeah, from from 2008, from the beginning, beginning of the operation. Um, the the uh, we are uh, we with the European Union. We are now in conversation with with uh, Tanzania and uh, Mauritius to try to reach similar agreements. Uh, I don't know what's the current status of the Kenya agreement. With Seychelles is ongoing, but they cannot they cannot. They only they can only transfer the pilots but not prosecute them in Seychelles and in Kenya. I am not quite sure. I don't know if it's finally uh, resolved. Yeah, I also have to look that up. Kenya earlier this year um, cancelled its well, its agreement with the EU, um, and the EU has been trying to, to negotiate. Uh, there, there was a six month um, int cancellation period, um, which must have expired by now. Um, and, um, the EU was trying to negotiate um, a re-signing of the, of the accord, um, but I have to admit that I, I haven't heard if they have been successful, so there might well be that currently we do not have a transfer agreement with Kenya. Um, yeah, it's, it simply is a, a problem facing as I say, there are various options being, being explored to address, to address this problem. Regional prosecution, um, prosecution in the countries concerned. In theory, you could do prosecution in flag states of vessels affected. Um, you could, uh, there are some who advocate uh, for the establishment of, of some sort of international judiciary, um, but uh, I think that's a, something which is unlikely to find consensus very soon. So uh, for the time being, we're just simply faced with the with problem. Um, at the beginning of October, we had a meeting in Brussels, the ASEAN 8 meeting, and the President Borbuki seemed to indicate that Europe wanted to have a, a more active player in global affairs. And one of the points that he made is that new agreements were being worked out with some of the ASEAN partners. And I've read recently that uh, we've, the EU has been approached on this by, with other partners, including India, China, Russia, making available uh, hospital ships and following the World Food Program, of course, things that never happened before. So in what ways the European Union be more active also in, in negotiating cooperation with other actors around the world as part of the shape of the agreement. Is, can you give us some hints of what President Borovka said about this in the ongoing negotiations? It's a difficult question you're asking. Um, I think you, you, you have to be cautious not to think that we're, we're negotiating some sort of umbrella agreements with anybody who just happens to run down the street saying in case you, have, you need help, the European Union will come along and provide it. Um, actually, or cooperation, or, or cooperation agreements. Um, actually, what, what this operation illustrates is that when there is a concrete problem um, facing or affecting European interests, and I think it's fair to speak for European interests, then um, the European Union will respond um, and uh, that's, that's led to us uh, getting engaged in Operation Atalanta. This has also uh, led to the European Union providing massive support for Amazon. It's led in other instances to the European, to European uh, Union uh, common foreign security uh, policy uh, missions in, in 
places uh, as far away as, as Congo, Bosnia, uh, Estonia, in uh, the Middle East, um, in uh, Iraq, uh, even in Aceh. Um, so, uh, but, but all, all of these were, were um, responses to concrete situations. They are not, uh, we do not go about it and making blanket or concluding blanket. Yeah, I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to point out that I've seen following the issue that there is a lot of enthusiasm. A lot of countries are lining up and powerful countries too, into cooperating with the EU somehow. We thought the EU must be very successful into being seen as a friendly, positive force in global affairs. Although we are still at the beginning level, what happens in the last few months, especially, is that many very useful, very powerful countries as they have been lining up to cooperate with the EU and this the last uh, network cooperation that's something that's seen quite, quite encouraging, I would say. That's what's true in one last question. Look there. Uh, uh, what is the force control? I have an idea what the you know, U.S. assets may be out there. What is the European Union deploying out in terms of ships? Yeah, I, I told you it was between six and ten. Six and ten. That's a rotational basis. Yeah, and then uh, Washington with uh, a uh, two four uh, patrol management. Very small dots. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, I'll, I'll take a look at the yeah. website. I just Don't go to Wikipedia, otherwise you will uh, <laughs> get up. Uh, because we are the bad guys and the pirates are the good ones over there. But uh, uh, more than 20 vessels and aircraft take part in uh, Atlanta. Now we have 1,800 military personnel. Uh, at the present time, the following EU member states are making an operational contribution to the operations. Netherlands, Spain, Germany, France, Greece, Sweden, Italy, Belgium. And Luxembourg, surprisingly, the UK, which provides the operational issue, doesn't show up. But 